All right, so we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning of chapter 10. So this is, um, this is a good point uh, that we stopped at last time. So we have four chapters left. They're kind of short, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And the first line here, as you're going to see, remember last time, uh, we talked about chapters eight and nine, which were all about the collection, collecting money. Now, now there's a big transition, right? Now it's like a, a complete break here. And the first line is, now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you. So this is an unusual way for Paul to start a new section, right? He, we've noticed that he doesn't normally do this. What he, what he did in 1 Corinthians, for example, uh, is typical that he would say, and now concerning, and now concerning. Remember, he would say, and now concerning meat sacrifice to idols, and now, con now considering sexual immorality, now considering uh, idols. Um, and the, the Greek word would be peri, peri, peri de, peri de, now concerning, now concerning. But here he says, he identifies himself, which he normally only does at the beginning of a letter. Ah. Uh, so remember, we talked about at the beginning <clears throat> that there are, there are possibly multiple letters here. So this is the point in which we think the most likely point where two letters were, were possibly stitched together. <clears throat> and so that, uh, that what we read last time was actually the end of the letter. And what we're starting to read now, these last four chapters, originally constituted a separate letter. <clears throat> Now, one interesting theory is that this, this, these four chapters were a separate letter and that they actually are the so-called, it, it actually is the so-called painful letter. All right, so let's review. Remember in 1 Corinthians, we know in 1 Corinthians, Paul refers to a previous letter he sent, so, which, which by all accounts is lost. <clears throat> so uh, 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians. Then in 2 Corinthians, he refers to a painful letter or a sorrowful letter that he had to write to them. So that would have been at least the, the third letter. <laughs> so what we just read, the beginning of 4 Corinthians, is probably the fourth letter, uh, the beginning of 2 Corinthians. And then this would be a fifth letter. <clears throat> now, we don't know uh, when it, you know, what order it came in. A lot of the themes in it really are picking up on the themes from 1 Corinthians. Um, especially about the idols. And then the, the main thing he's talking about is he really kind of lets loose on these apostles, <clears throat> quote unquote apostles, who have come in after him into Corinth and are teaching something different, a different gospel of some kind. So that's the main, uh, and so he, he's, a, he's a little bit harsh uh, against them, these false apostles, and he accuses some of the Corinthians of, of being uh, foolish by following these false apostles. So some people think, well, maybe <clears throat> this is that painful letter that he had to write and that it's got stuck on here. We don't, we don't know for sure. The, it really, to be honest, it doesn't matter. To me, it's just interesting because of, I like this kind of detective work. Um, but uh, let's see, what was I gonna say? <laughs> yeah, and it's not that anybody's trying to trick anybody by having this did you see him well my the way the second letter having having these letters combined if that's true there is an argument that it, it's it's all one original piece but if it is a second letter it really doesn't change anything and it's not any attempt to uh, trick the readers what happened in, in the ancient world was of course like we've said before it was very expensive to copy books very expensive um so and normally, <laughs> you either had scrolls very early on, like in Jesus' time, they were still using scrolls primarily. So each book of the scriptures uh, would be a scroll. <laughs> and a scroll usually was about, you could get practically, you could get about 30 feet <laughs> in a scroll but before it became too unwieldy. So that means you have a, a set amount of space to copy down text, right? Um, it's almost like I think of, um, you know, when, when uh, pop music started, um, technology had it so that the record really could only hold about three minutes of music. And so that's why pop songs developed into about three minutes long, because it fit the technology, it fit the space, right? 
So the same kind of thing happens here. You have this, you have an X amount of scroll space. <clears throat> and so they wanted to utilize it all. So what they would normally do is, um, for example, there, according to the Protestant canon and the Jewish canon of the Old Testament, there are 39 books in the Old Testament. We have a couple more like Maccabees, etc. But let's say 39 books. But if you look at all the ancient Christians, so the fathers of the church, they refer to there either being 22 or 24 books of the Old Testament. Why? Because a lot of the books were combined, oh. right? So what they call a book, like the book of the minor prophets. So, you know, you have the 12 minor prophets, including Jonah, which is only four chapters, Micah, et cetera, which is short. So because these 12 minor prophets uh, were all short, they could be, be combined into one scroll. <laughs> and so that became, so those 12 different books became one book. That's how the ancient Christians saw nice it. Know they don't took it out. <laughs> and they made other combinations like Ezra and Nehemiah were combined into one book, even though they're totally different. One is written in the first person, one's written in the third person, but they are combined together to save space. <clears throat> So it's not that anyone is trying to trick anybody. It's just this is what was done in the ancient world. To save space, you would include whatever you could. In fact, this is an interesting tidbit. So there's a Codex Sinaiticus. So it means the Codex. The Codex was really a Christian invention that comes about uh, soon after the dawn of Christianity by the Christians who want to collect all the sacred scriptures into one book. And so the Christians actually kind of invent the book, the modern book, the codex it's called. And um, they would take either papyrus or vellum uh, and they would bind it into a book so that you would have all of the, uh, you could fit uh, as many books as you want into one place. So uh, they started doing this. The, the, one of the first times we think they did this was in collecting Paul's letters actually. So from very early on, so from maybe about the year 100, Paul's letters no longer circulate individually. So we have no manuscripts at all anywhere of just Galatians or just 1 Corinthians. It's all by 100, someone, the church had put the, together in one book <clears throat> and the current order basically that we have them in now. Uh, and we actually have a manuscript that they found in Egypt in Oxyrhynchus. Did you go... So Arxarhynchus is a really famous uh, location. It was actually a dump in, in ancient Egypt, but because it was in the middle of the desert, <laughs> this landfill dump, they found all these ancient manuscripts in there that had been preserved by the dry climate in this dump. So they found tons of ancient manuscripts, including one called, they call it P46, Papyrus 46, written on papyrus, made in Egypt, um, probably from around the year 150. And it includes all of Paul's epistles. This is the, these are the oldest records we have of uh, Paul's epistles. <clears throat> so anyway, what did I say? So the Codex Sinaiticus was made by, was commissioned by Constantine the Great. As soon as he makes, uh, he declares that Christianity is no longer illegal, he then funds the production of 50 uh, codices, codexes, um, that include the Old Testament and the New Testament. So these would have been, I don't know what the price would have been, but say a million dollars each or something like that. That's how much they would have cost for the whole Bible. And he would give them to, and he would give them to the 50 largest churches in the empire, <laughs> the big cathedrals. Um, the churches. Yeah. Which churches it was? Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But the interesting thing about this is, so we have this book from maybe around the year 325, 330. And in the Old Testament, it has all the books of the Old Testament. And then it has other things included in the Old Testament, like the interesting thing is the biblical odes. So in Orthros, you know, matins that we, the service we do before the liturgy in the morning, uh, we sing that it's called the odes or the biblical odes. And there are nine odes that we sing. And the, the ninth ode is the famous one, which is, does anyone know? Uh, more honorable than the cherubim, and God compare more glorious than the seraphim. He without corruption gave us birth to, to the failed to, to, to the mother of God. So this biblical, oh, these biblical oaths were actually copied into the Old Testament. Uh, why? Because uh, somebody uh, had commissioned this and they had some extra room. And so they put the things that they were actually using in the church, which is, so that tells us that they were already singing these nine oaths that we still sing today in the year 300. <laughs> 
They were, and they were singing the ninth ode to the Theotokos, to the Mother of God, already, already in the year 300. But they included it in the Bible because they didn't, they didn't have the same idea that we did. The, the, this idea of what was sacred scripture and what wasn't wasn't so clearly defined yet. So sometimes we find other books uh, in these Old Testaments, in these codices. <clears throat> well, to be honest with you, in Greece, who not only growing up, 60 years ago, 70, we did not learn the Old Testament as a like the Bible we do today. Yeah. We have it just like we have the 12 uh, gods yeah. in a history. Yeah. So that one was a history. And when I came here, uh, I watched in the television because I was not driving at the time. I had kids and all that. And I said, well, I don't understand what they're talking about because I've never been to English school to learn English. And when Tulu went to Greece about 15, 20 years ago, I told Tula, please, will you come back? Don't come back. You still don't bring me an old uh, testament from Greece. Oh, Greek. In Greek, yeah. Well, can't you believe it? She went to Mithiyeki because we, Mithiyeki is the protagonist. Mean, from Hala, and we live 15 minutes away from Litiyengi. And my family lives, some of them in Litiyengi anyway. And she went all the bookstores, I cannot find one. Hmm. And then my cousin took her to the main church in the Litiyengi, and they have uh, over there bubble uh, store, kind of bookstore. Yeah. Yeah, book and she got me one from them, and she gave it to me. And was it in easy to read Greek? Or no, I did it. Not but I, so I love this more for the little bubble. Yeah. I don't, I don't use that. I don't yeah, understand yeah. it. But for this little bubble is the words we use every day, and yes. that's how they are going. Yeah. So, yeah. And I learned more since then than I knew all yeah. my life. Yeah, yeah, and we, I know how important it is to learn the Old Testament because that's our roots. Mm -hmm. And if we don't know the roots, we're not steady, mm -hmm. we're not strong. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy now who are here, even for you. You know, so many times you have spoken the church and then you say about the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So yeah, so she's asking who put the books in this order? Well, in the, New Testament. And the, the, the church is the short answer, but like for the books of the this collection of Paul's epistles, originally they just they just lined them up in order of length. Okay. So Romans is the longest, that's why it's first, and then first okay. Corinthians, second Corinthians. So just from longest to shortest. Uh, and so originally in, in like this P46 from the year 150, Hebrews, which is at the end of Paul's epistles, because there was some always been some question whether Paul wrote it or not. But in the earliest manuscript, Hebrews is long. It's second longest after Romans. So it's it goes Romans, Hebrews, first Corinthians, second Corinthians. But at some point, because the church was debating whether to include Hebrews or not, it got moved to the end. So and then for the gospels, uh, I'm not really sure how. I think it was an order that it was the order that the church thought they were written in, I think. Okay. They thought the church always considered Matthew to be the oldest. So that was first. And they considered John to be like the kind of outlier. So that was last. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so my point is that even if this is a second letter, uh, it doesn't really, it, there's no, no one's trying to trick anybody. I don't see any reason why someone would, would want to do that, what you could possibly gain from doing that. Uh, it was just uh, the custom at the time in copying things. <laughs> All right, so, so you can imagine there's a different setting in which this was read from what we read before, because his tone does kind of change. So he says, now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, and he's talking about himself, but being absent and bold toward you. All right, so what he's doing is he's alluding here to a criticism that's being leveled against him, and it's, he's going to it's going to come up in a few lines again. 
that these new uh, apostles that came in after Paul left Corinth. <clears throat> so Paul originally, you know, we, we read in Acts that Paul went to Corinth and that he spent at least 18 months living there, possibly up to two, three years uh, that he was living with them. So this wasn't, uh, this was one of his most kind of intimate communities that he actually spent the most time with along with Ephesus. Um, so, but after he left, these other apostles came in who seemed to have been following Paul wherever he made uh, converts, wherever he established churches, and were trying to get these, they were angry or upset at Paul over this whole issue of, do you have to become Jewish to become Christian? <laughs> and they thought Paul was, was uh, shortchanging the Jewish tradition by not requiring these pagans to be circumcised, for example, and to follow other laws from the Old Testament. So they were going around after Paul and correcting his teaching. So he would go in and tell them, you know, Paul told you this, but he didn't tell you the whole story. You really need to get circumcised. You really need to follow these dietary laws or whatever it may be. <clears throat> so Paul um, has this reputation of, uh, so this tells us also that this letter was, was later, <clears throat> that he has this reputation of writing powerful letters. And we know that this was his reputation from the very beginning. I mean, Peter in first or second Peter talks about how the, our brother Paul writes letters that are powerful and dif but difficult to understand. <clears throat> so he has this reputation that he sends these powerful letters in which he's bold, but then when he's with them in person, he's not very impressive because we know that he was short, he was bald, he was bow-legged, uh, and that was all before uh, he was beaten uh, at least five times by the Jews, shipwrecked, uh, etc. So he, he wasn't, and he worked with his hands. He was a, a tradesman. <laughs> he was a leather worker, tent maker. So there was nothing uh, about him when he came into town that was impressive, right? He didn't dress the part. He didn't look the part. Uh, he was not intimidating. He wasn't a particularly well-refined speaker like they were used to from these philosophical teachers. And so the criticism of Paul is, uh, all right, he writes these big letters and he threatens, you know, and he, he, you know, talks big, but when he's here, he's nobody. And he says, but I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some. All right, so in other words, he's saying, he's saying watch out. Uh, you, th you think I'm weak in person, but watch out when I come again. Uh, I intend to be bold against some. So there are some troublemakers still that he has to be bold with and that he's been bold with before when he visited the second time. He excommunicated some people from the church even. And now in the beginning of 2 Corinthians, that letter, he was... Uh, trying to reconcile everybody, let them back into the church, comfort them, right? be reconciled with me, be reconciled with one another. <clears throat> but apparently there's still some, some problem here. So when he comes again, he intends to be bold against some. This is some maybe some reason to think that this is the painful or sorrowful letter that he sent. <clears throat> and that then he came, we know, after that, and it was this unpleasant visit. So maybe that's a good evidence that it, this is that painful letter. Um, that actually was before what we just read. <laughs> we don't know. Um, so in other words, so he says, uh, I, tend to, I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. So apparently what these some, these critics of Paul who have fallen under the sway of these new apostles, uh, their kind of opinion, and we got this impression in 1 Corinthians 2, was, again, that Paul didn't look the part. He was, especially to these upper-class, wealthy Corinthians from pagan backgrounds, Paul was an embarrassment to them because their Greek pagan friends would join philosophical schools or religions, but it was respectable, right? The teachers looked the part. They were paid well. Uh, they were refined and educated, and so these wealthy Corinthians have accepted Christ, but the, and Paul was the one who gave them the gospel, but there's still some kind of tension uh, with, you know, they're not comfortable with Paul because he embarrasses them to some extent. <clears throat> and, and they start to think that he's all about, uh, he's all about worldly things, that he's about collecting this money, for example. <laughs> Uh, that he's about attracting followers, baptizing people, getting big numbers, establishing more and more churches. 
Yeah. You cannot please everybody. <laughs> That's right. So he's saying that these people, these critics, who are probably the wealthy upper class Corinthians, some of them anyway, <clears throat> they think he walks according to the flesh. In other words, that he's concerned about all these earthly things, like having followers and getting money and da 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 da. Uh, so then he says in verse three, for though we walk in the flesh, he's not denying that he's a human, he bears a body. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So he's talking about war. He's not talking about a philosophical school. He's talking about war. What kind of war? For the weapon, what's that? I was saying a spiritual war. Yeah, exactly. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, fleshly, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So strongholds would be the word for uh, the, the fortress, the uh, you know, in the, in the ancient Greek city, you typically had an Acropolis, right? So Athens, of course, has the famous Acropolis. Corinth has an Acropolis also that's way up the mountain. It's still preserved. It's a fortified place where if that city was attacked, uh, everyone would go. And it was usually at the high place because it's easier to defend. Well, what also, what also is usually built in the ancient world at the high place, at the highest point? What, what was inside these fortresses in the city? What was it protecting? The people. The people, but what else? What was in there? What? The church. No. The church, the, the pagan gods. So all the, the cults to the pagan gods, the temples were located inside the fortress. So we think probably he's talking about for pulling down strongholds that again, he's talking, remember back in First Corinthians, there's this big dispute about their relationship. They were still going to pagan temples and celebrating, uh, uh, worshiping these idols and celebrating these banquets and dinners at pagan temples, etc. So it seems like maybe Paul's, he means pulling down strongholds metaphorically, but he could also mean literally <laughs> uh, taking down the pagan temples that they were still engaged in. Casting down arguments. So, uh, which is another thing that they're bringing up against him. They're interested in this philosophy and uh, debates between schools. And so he says, pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Knowledge of God meaning not just knowing things about God, but the experience of God, knowing God on a personal level. Um, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. All right, so this is a famous line that the church often reflects on in the, in the spiritual literature. So bringing, what does it mean to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ? So the, and the, we tend to think now in our modern day post-enlightenment, post-Sigmund Freud, <laughs> we all assume we're we're all basically even if we're religious we're all all of us today are basically modernists materialists in some way and so part of materialism assumes that we create our own thoughts right <laughs> that we generate our own thoughts in our mind and that there's this kind of self-reflective process going on the ancients didn't think that way at all they, that was totally foreign to them they and, and think about it too have you ever had the experience of generating a thought? Or like, have you actually composed the thought yourself or does it just pop into your mind as a thought ready made? So the ancients, their experience was that they didn't compose thoughts necessarily. Uh, they didn't will thoughts into existence, but that these thoughts came to them. <laughs> and so the ancient, in the ancient mind, which includes the Greeks and includes the Jews, uh, Jesus assumes this too, is that the thoughts come from outside, the devil. From, the, from either from the angels or from the devil, right, the demons, right, <clears throat> so that, that it's a spiritual warfare, and this again is an, a, an example where we see Paul's teaching parallel with Jesus' teaching, now Jesus would talk about the heart, right, uh, because in the Hebrew mind, in the Jewish mind, uh, the heart was the center of man, they didn't think so much in terms of the mind, Right? The heart was man's the center, the soul, we would say maybe. And in the Greek world, they talked about the noose, 
the mind, something like the mind. So they're they're really the same thing, but in the Hebrew in the Hebrew conception, they talk about the heart. For Paul, he's talking to Greeks now. He's he talks more about the mind. But in any case, you know, Jesus says that it's not uh, you know it's not just those who commit adultery, but those, anyone who lusts after someone in his heart, <laughs> right? So he's talking about. Jesus is challenging us uh, in the Sermon on the Mount that just, just controlling our actions, Jesus says, is not enough. We're actually called to control our thoughts as well. <laughs> That's where the spiritual warfare takes place. At first at the level of behavior, but then more deeply at the level of thoughts. So this is what exactly what Paul is saying here, is that <clears throat> the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but rather, there are these spiritual uh, tools that we use, and the purpose is to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. In other words, to conform, to only accept those thoughts that are coming that conform, that are obedient to Christ. I'm real with that because for myself, if I love something, it is here in my mind. It might come and go. <laughs> and I forget. <laughs> I forget. But everything I have in my heart never goes away. It's still there. And that, the church talks about this kind of connection between so, the mind and I the heart. That. That's yeah. and that's the role of the noose. The noose kind of combines both of these concepts here. <clears throat> so you know what, Father? This conversation reminds me of one of my favorite um uh quotations except i don't know it word for word from saint paisius about sinful thoughts and he says the mind is like um uh, an airport i think with helicopters circling around and as long as you don't let those sinful thoughts land mm -hmm. it's, it's okay <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they can't, they can't land and take a place in your your news. Yeah, yeah. He says you can see them flying overhead, yeah. but as long as you don't take those flags and, and wave them down, yeah. then you haven't committed a sin. So it's again this idea that Saint Paisius has too that the thoughts are coming from the outside, from the spiritual forces, and that our job is to uh, discern, discern the like, thoughts. Uh, and this is where we get this, so we this line is quoted a lot when the well, father's father, talking. Yeah. But, well, I was just listening to what Vina was saying, and you were saying so you have these thoughts, and unless you act on them, it's not a sin, but you can have sinful thoughts too, right? Yeah. So he says, don't let them land. I mean, they can yes. be there, but if you don't let them land, if they don't take possession of your 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 mind and your heart yeah. and you know just the sign of the cross will defer yeah. a lot of that. it's like think of it think of them as seeds right so these thoughts are like seeds that the demons are throwing uh, onto this ground of our mind now the question is do we provide a fertile ground for these seeds to land and grow in or do we just simply ignore them right and let them die on their own mm -hmm. if we ignore them you know, we, we see them, right? Because they're, they're, they're not being generated from us. They're coming at us from the outside. They're being thrown across, across our mind. Like in Compline, we say, we, we compare them to the fiery darts of the evil one, the uh, small Compline that we read in the evening, right? So he's throwing these darts in our mind all the time, these evil thoughts. But if we don't, if we don't hold on to them, like let's say, for example, we have a, a thought comes across our mind about a wrong that somebody did to us, right? We can either say, oh, well, God forgive them and move on, or we can harbor it, right, and have a bitterness and resentment and start reflecting on it, right, start playing with it, turning it around, analyzing it. So that's that's when it becomes sinful, right? That That's when we've, we've kind of, even if we don't act on it, but we've already kind of accepted the thought. So the fathers talked a lot about this line in relation to the Jesus prayer. <clears throat> The, the prayer, the Jesus prayer is known as the prayer of the heart or uh, the prayer of a single thought, it's called. So what do they mean? It, it means that by, by us constantly repeating, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. The point is to make Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus Christ, to be our single thought, right? And to focus only on Jesus Christ and thereby ignore 
all these other thoughts that are trying to distract us, right? That must be the devil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, all right. So he says, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. He's referring to the last judgment. <clears throat> Christ will come again. Uh, let's see. All right, 10 7. Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. <clears throat> uh, for even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. All right, so now he's, he's referring back to this reputation he has of being uh, kind of fierce and bold in his letters, but of being weak in the personal appearance. <clears throat> So he's criticizing the, this group that's seeing him in a worldly way um, and that's judging him by worldly outward appearances like, oh, he's, he doesn't look like a philosopher. He doesn't dress the part. He works with his hands. He doesn't accept any money. No good teacher works for free, right? Um, <clears throat> so uh, and then he says, because he does talk about his authority, but he's somewhat you know, reluctant to kind of play the trump card of his authority. But so he wants to mention it, but he doesn't want to um, overplay his hand, I guess you could say. So he's saying, yeah, it's true. The Lord has given me authority over you, but the Lord gave it for your edification, for edification, for building up, building up the church and not for tearing down, not for your destruction. So I was given this authority to take care of you. Um, I shall not be ashamed lest I seem to terrify you by letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So this is Paul kind of quoting what his critics are gossiping about him. <clears throat> Let such a person who would make this critique consider this, that when we are, that what we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such we will also be indeed when we are present. So that's kind of, Ouch. Uh, he's saying, oh, you think I'm weak? Mm. Wait and see. Wait and see. Uh, so then he continues, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. All right? This is a big issue that he talks about a lot in his letters, commending yourself. So in the ancient world, I mean, we still have vestiges of this practice today where, like, especially kids going to college or scholarship, applying for scholarships, you need a letter of recommendation, right? <laughs> so in the ancient world, letters of recommendation were huge. You needed them for everything. Everywhere you traveled, you, you would take a letter of recommendation so that someone would provide you hospitality. There would, there would be some way for someone to know you somewhat. If you had a letter from a mutual friend or someone who's respected, like the mayor of your town, I don't know who he is, but if the mayor wrote you a letter, you must be respectable. <laughs> um, so, but and it was considered very bad form to commend yourself, right? Uh, you wouldn't write yourself a recommendation letter that you would send to the scholarship committee, right? <laughs> so it was considered bad form to commend yourself. So he is kind of commending himself. He has to defend his reputation, but he's, you can see he's sensitive about it because he wants to do it with some uh, grace so that he doesn't get accused of uh, being full of himself. <laughs> so then he says in 13, we, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. So he's saying, he's admitting that he is kind of commending himself a little. He's kind of reviewing his credentials for them. And he says, it's true, God has given me this authority uh, over this particular realm or sphere, meaning uh, that Paul was given to be the apostle to the Gentiles, to the nations. And so, and they're in Corinth, mainly uh, Gentiles who become Christians. <laughs> 14, for we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you. For it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, <clears throat> not boasting of things beyond measure, that is in other men's labors. This is gonna kind of be important. Uh, not boasting in what other men had done, 
but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. So he kind of sees, and this is the tradition of the church, that when the 12 apostles were sent out, each had their own sphere, each had their own area, realm, that they were to go to, that they cast lots, according to tradition, to go and evangelize the world. And Paul understood that he had a particular mission to the Gentiles, to the Gentiles. So he mentions here kind of messing in other men's labors, because this is his complaint, is that these Judah, Jewish apostles, Judaizing apostles, have come behind him in his labor and are trying to change things. <clears throat> but his hope, Paul's hope, he says, was that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere to preach the gospel in the reaches beyond you. So in other words, that was Paul's uh, desire, was to keep moving west into Gentile territory and to have, he would, that. yes, and he would establish a church and then he would kind of expect that church to support him as he continued oh, wow. further on. So he could establish another church, right? So this is, this is what he hoped for, right? So he's saying, I'm not interested in my personal enrichment, right? What I hoped for was that the community here would grow and be able to support me as I continue to preach the gospel. <clears throat> 1017, but he who glories, let him glory in the Lord, for not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. So he's again answering this criticism uh, from the critics who are probably saying, this guy just commends himself. Who is he? You know, and he's saying, the Lord commends me. I have a direct revelation from Jesus Christ that gave me this authority. <laughs> All right, that's the end of 10. Now we move into chapter 11. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. All right, so this is another kind of letter writing technique, oracle technique, is that he, he talks about folly or being the fool. And speaking a kind of, uh, he says, talks about about speaking foolishly. Um, we'll see what he means here. Um, so he, he's talking a little bit crazy way, in a way that may be a little bit difficult for them to understand, but he's doing it out of, this love and zeal for them. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. So this is what he's saying is kind of foolish, the way he's going to talk about them right now. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So Paul is saying that the gospel I preached to you is pretty simple. Then these Jewish apostles have come in and made it more complicated. That you have to get circumcised, you have to follow the dietary laws, etc. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, and really spirit should be capitalized because it's talking about the Holy Spirit, which they receive, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. In other words, he's afraid that these uh, that they're so naive and that they're so uh, that there's so much criticism against Paul that they're going to accept this false gospel that's being preached to them. He's afraid that they're that naive. <clears throat> now it's interesting that he says he who preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached because usually there's only a really a handful of times in all of Paul's letters where he just calls Jesus, Jesus. He usually calls him Lord or Christ, Lord or Christ. But here that wouldn't make sense, right? Because what's he talking about? Preaches another, if he said preaches another Lord, then the Lord is the word he's used to describe any of these um, so-called gods, right? So if he says preaches another Lord, it, he could be meaning that instead of Jesus is Lord, that, you know, Apollo is Lord, or, you know, one of these pagan gods. So he doesn't use that word. <clears throat> he doesn't say preach another Christ, because Christ means the Messiah. So they're, they're, no one's saying that, well, Jesus wasn't the Messiah. It's this other guy, John, that no one's heard of. He's the Messiah. No one's saying that. He's saying that it's another Jesus. In other words, <laughs> the, the person that I know and love, the person who revealed himself to me and sent me on this commission and who I've devoted my life to, the, the person I know, the Jesus I know, is different 
from the one that you're understanding now. <laughs> so, uh, meaning it could mean any number of things, but we think about, you know, later heresies in the church where some people said Jesus was fully God and fully man, the Orthodox position. Some say, no, he wasn't truly human. He was only God or no, he wasn't truly God. He was only human. This, this for Paul would be another Jesus, right? Because it's not the same God. It's not the same Lord that he knows. There's something fundamentally different about him. It's, that's why it's a big deal to us that, we, that he's fully God and fully human and why there was such a battle over that because it's about who is Jesus, right? <clears throat> who do men say that I am? We have the same problem in our own day. I mean, I would, especially with the more extreme, you know, like the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, well, they, they really don't accept Jesus. No, well. it's a different Jesus, yeah. right? Like the the. But they do believe the same God. They believe in the same God, yes. But so, like the Mormons, for example, believe that Jesus, uh, that God had many uh, sons, <laughs> and that at some point in time, one of these sons uh, became incarnate as Jesus. Right? We don't accept that, right? Or Jehovah's Witnesses say that he wasn't, um, they have kind of, they say that they have a kind of confusing theology. Like, one, they say that there wasn't really a cross, that he was put on a stake and that, you know, he was only human. He wasn't fully God, but that this angel kind of inhabited him or something. So these are, we don't understand this. Their Jesus is not the same Jesus that I know, right? <laughs> There's something different. Was he well, they call it on the third day. Did they believe in that? Resurrection? That's a big question. I, I would assume so, but I can't say for sure. Okay. Yeah, I would assume so. But so then there's something for us that's important. Is it who is he? Is he fully God and fully man? Is he only a creature? Is he only God and not never really became fully man? Uh, this is a different Jesus that's being preached. So uh, you may, so he's afraid that they may well put up with this. 11.5. For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. <laughs> and he could be. He could be sarcastic here. He could be referring to these so-called apostles that were in there. Um, but anyway, he says, I am not all fear to the most eminent apostles. Or he could be referring to the what he says in Galatians are the pillars, Peter, John, and James. Even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. Again, knowledge, not just knowing things about God, but having an experience of God, which he's going to talk about in a few lines. Um, Mother, may, may I ask? He was a well educated uh, yes. Hebrew scholar, was he not? He was. He was very well educated in, in both Greek and in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So, but he probably didn't have, I mean, rhetoric yeah, in particular. Yeah. It, was, it was was this whole branch of, of, mm -hmm. of learning. And so he probably didn't have like advanced studies in, in rhetoric so that he would be a professional philosopher. But he definitely had some familiarity with rhetoric. So he mm -hmm. just not maybe advanced to the high. He didn't have maybe a PhD, only a masters or something you know he but he definitely knew some elements of rhetoric because he's aware of all these conventions about commending yourself etc uh all right so yeah i'm not in knowledge but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things in other words you guys know me i've been trans i, I lived with you for at least 18 months two years uh I've been thoroughly transparent with you. I've been myself. You, you've seen me. You're not just basing this on hearsay or the letters. I lived with you. I went to your weddings. I went to your funerals. You know who I am. <laughs> Did I, 11.7, Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. So he's really kind of shaming them now. Though he's saying that the churches in Macedonia, up in northern Greece, are paying me to come here and minister to you, which would have followed his pattern, right? So that as he keeps moving west, he goes south to Corinth, but basically he keeps heading west into Gentile territory, that he first stopped as, after he came out of modern-day Turkey, he first went to northern Greece, and then they sent him on uh, to continue his mission in Corinth, and they continued to support him. 
And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so I will keep myself. <clears throat> As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Achaia is the whole province around Corinth. Why? Because I don't love you? God knows. <clears throat> So he's saying, I'm going to boast about the fact that I didn't take any money from you. Uh, for them, it's uh, they're, some of them are complaining about him not taking money. So it just goes to show you, you can't please everybody, that someone's going to complain about something. right? So they're actually complaining, these wealthier probably Corinthians are complaining that he's not taking money. Because it's a shame to them that he's working with his hands instead. They would prefer him to take their money and not work with his hands and act like a proper teacher and dress to part, etc. Cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> but he's saying, he's kind of flipping it on them and saying, you guys should actually be ashamed of yourself because <laughs> I purposely didn't take the money so that you wouldn't have any criticisms against me that I came here for these worldly reasons. And so I'm going to boast about this, the fact that I didn't take money. And why did I do this? Is it because I don't love you that I came and worked for two years without any money? So, so, you know, working with my hands to support myself? No, God knows the truth. <clears throat> All right, 11, 12. But what I do, I will also continue to do. That I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. <clears throat> For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. So he's talking about these so-called apostles that came after him. Um, so he's saying, what I do, I will continue to do. I not, That is not take money to minister to them <clears throat> so that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are. For those, from those, in other words, who want to be regarded as apostles, who are using this issue to attack me potentially, uh, I'm purposely not taking the money so that they don't have this opportunity to attack me. They can't use money uh, as, as an excuse. <clears throat> and this is a difference between me and them. Such are false. So an apostle literally means one who is sent, right? One who is sent as an official representative. So he's saying they're false apostles. They're fake apostles. They're claiming they're being sent by Christ. He says, but Christ didn't send them. They're false. They're, they're fake. They're liars. They're deceitful workers transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. In other words, ordaining themselves, declaring themselves that they are apostles. <laughs> and no wonder. For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. So he's saying they're Satan. He is, that's what he's saying. He's saying that these false apostles are Satan or working for Satan, right? So he, he is he's pretty, pretty firm here. He, he's not a big fan of these guys who have come in. 15. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. In other words, they'll be judged at the end um, for what they did. I say again, let this is verse 16. I say again, let no one think me a fool. If otherwise, at least receive me as a fool, that I also may boast a little. So again, this whole thing of boasting, commending yourself, playing the fool, these are all kind of rhetorical techniques that he's playing with, which shows that he, the irony is that he's just admitted, admitted I'm untrained you know, in rhetoric, meaning I'm not an expert, but then he's using all these techniques, <clears throat> maybe to kind of show them up. Uh, <clears throat> what I speak, I speak not according to the Lord. Now, remember, Paul uses this as like a formula. He'll say when he speaks from the Lord or according to the Lord, he's, he's speaking something that's been directly revealed to him by the Lord or he's speaking something authoritative that this is how it's going to be in the churches when he speaks according to the Lord. Here he says, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. So in other words, he's saying, I'm here and I'm speaking freely. I'm not speaking on behalf of the Lord. It's me, Paul. Let's have some real talk here. This is what he's saying. <laughs> Seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I also will boast according to the flesh, according to worldly things. For you put up with fools gladly, since you, you yourselves are wise. All right, now, obviously, he's being sarcastic, and this goes back to 1 Corinthians. Remember, he says, 
almost the same thing. He says, we are, we are uh, unwise, but you are wise. We're weak, but you're strong. <clears throat> so he's, put, he's doing this again. For you put up with fools gladly, since you yourselves are wise. For you put up with it if one brings you into bondage, if one devours you, if one takes from you. He's talking about money and possessions. If one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face, to our shame, I say that we were too weak for that. So again, this language of wisdom and being weak. So there's a lot of themes that are coming out for 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> uh, we were too weak for that. He's being sarcastic. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. So Paul is going to talk about these worldly worldly things of reputation but he's gonna he says that he's speaking about them foolishly because he knows that before god none of these things matter right but somehow they matter to the some of these corinthians so he's going to indulge them and continue to kind of read off his resume his credentials but he thinks it's silly you know he doesn't normally he wouldn't normally talk like that <clears throat> so it, it, for example he says eleven twenty two. are they hebrews so am i so you can imagine that these other apostles have come in, probably from Judea, um, strong Jewish identity, and probably what they're doing is they're concerned about Paul, uh, Paul's teaching about circumcision and so on. Uh, so they're coming in and saying, well, we're Hebrews, we're Jews, we're from Palestine, we're from the Holy Land. Um, and Paul's saying, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more a minister of Christ, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often, meaning in kind of dangerous situations. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. <clears throat> so these 40 stripes minus one, I think they mentioned it in Acts too. Uh, it was one of the punishments that the synagogue could impose on its members. Uh, for transgressions. So five times Paul, probably for preaching Jesus and, and refusing to stop preaching Jesus in the synagogues, was sentenced five different times, by probably five different synagogues, 40 stripes minus one. Why? Because in Deuteronomy 25.3, it states that a criminal should not receive more than 40 lashes. This, is, this was a, a law from the Old Testament. It was to limit man's cruelty to, to man, to limit the punishment. And so what did they do in the synagogues? Remember, the synagogues were run basically by Pharisees, by these rabbis. So part of the Pharisaic way of thinking creeps in here. So in order to put a fence around the law, this is what the Pharisees always did. They put a fence around the law, they said. So if it says you shall not exceed 40, they took that very seriously. So they said, so they said, just to make sure, in case there's a miscount, in case someone miscounts, we're actually only going to do 39. So that if there's a miscount and there's one extra, it's 40, and we still haven't broken the law. So this is what this is what he's referring to. This was the, the practice in the synagogues. So he was he was tied to a post and whipped 39 times, uh, five different times. And then he says, three times, verse 25, three times I was beaten with rods. So that was a punishment that the, uh, that the Romans used. Was, and there was actually even a symbol, uh, someone who had authority to impose these kind of physical punishments had a symbol with, um, with uh, I, th I think, if I'm not mistaken, the correct term in English, the old term is a faggot, which was a, a, um, a, a, a bundle of wood bundle of rods right <clears throat> so a roman who had the authority to inflict punishment would have that kind of on his his crest this, this bundle of wood because it meant he had the power of the rod to beat <clears throat> somebody so three times he was beaten by rods in other words he's saying from the jews he was beaten five times from the romans he was beaten three times that's what he's saying once i was stoned that would have been from the jews three times i was shipwrecked a night and a day i had been in the deep so he was a night and a day, he was floating in the middle of the Mediterranean somewhere and somehow got rescued. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, 
and weariness and toil and sleeplessness often and hunger and thirst and fasting was often and cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily? My deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? So he's saying despite the fact that he, he's, he is commending himself, he's listing his resume here, <clears throat> uh, but it's this kind of inverted resume from what the Corinthians, the worldly Corinthians are expecting. They're expecting this list of accomplishments and awards. And for Paul, these are his decorations. The number of times he's been beaten for being obedient to Christ. <clears throat> Um, and despite all these things, he still his overriding concern daily is not his own life, but it's his concern for the churches that he founded. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? In other words, he has this complete um, uh, identification with uh, his members, his, his flock. <clears throat> if I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Eratos the king, Eratos was the king of the Nabataeans, which is, have you ever, uh, have you ever heard of the place called Petra in Jordan? So I went there one time, it's really fascinating. But the theory is that the Petra, which is this hidden city that was carved into the rocks, was actually a Nabataean city so that and it would have been around the time that uh, of Paul actually that this city was uh, alive and it was on this trade route um so the Nabataean but so at that time the Nabataean kingdom was further south of Damascus usually the center of it but by this time the Nabataeans had a, a, a increased their reach almost all the way to Damascus. And so that there was a quarter in Damascus that was the Nabataean quarter and there was a Jewish quarter. So the Nabataeans had some, some uh, sway, some influence there. So under Eratos, the Nabataean king in Damascus uh, was guarding the city of the Damascenes, of uh, people of Damascus, with a garrison desiring to arrest me. So the Nabataean king had sent Nabataean soldiers to Damascus to arrest Paul. Why? We don't, we don't know. It talks about this in Acts 9.25. It talks about Paul being lowered um, out of the city. And that's what he says here. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. So in other words, they were, uh, you know, they were these fortified cities. And then many times houses were built into the walls, right? So it wasn't like a freestanding house. It was on the inside. Three walls were added against the outside wall. And you can see this in all the ancient Greek cities. This is what people did. So it seems that that Paul was in this house that was high up in the fortress and that had a, a big enough window that a human being could get in and out. To be that big, it means that the window had to be high up because otherwise they would be afraid about enemy soldiers climbing in. So you can picture this house, you know, way up high in the fortress and Paul being lowered down in a basket down this wall. Now, so it's an interesting uh, image <laughs> of this escape. But the, a lot of people have scratched their head. Of, why does he mention it here? It seems to be like a kind of non sequitur. Um, he did just a few lines before have this list of things that he suffered. Then he kind of starts talking about something else. Then he goes back and mentions Damascus, this incident. It could be that he just kind of, remember, he, when he's writing these letters, he's just speaking. He's dictating them and someone's writing them down. So it could be that he kind of remembered it uh, after he started to move on to something else. He remembered something he wanted to say and he mentioned it. Some people have some more elaborate theories that that this is what happens sometimes that in the in the manuscripts, <laughs> there would be there were margins, right? And so there would be an official copyist who would make the copies, but then there would always be a, a scribe who would review all the copies. For, for mistakes. And so apparently uh, a scribe was reviewing, uh, so the theory is that a scribe was reviewing a manuscript and they would sometimes make notes in the margins, um, just things that struck them. And so some people say that someone reading this list of, of things that Paul suffered, knowing Acts 9.25, then wrote in the margin about 
oh, also Paul was lowered down from a basket. And then somehow I got copied into the main text. Who knows? It is kind of odd that he, why does he mention it yeah. here? The, the other thing though is we're going to stop here because it's the end of the chapter. But in the next chapter, he's going to, it's a famous uh, scene, <laughs> a famous line where he talks about his um, uh, going, being taken up into the third heaven, this spiritual experience of this man in Christ that he knows. So some people say that this, this image of Paul descending from the wall is now going to kind of, then he's going to flip it around and show this ascent that he has up to the third heaven. Some people say also maybe he's trying to show, um, I mean, because it's not a great look, actually. It's not like he's telling a story about how he single-handedly fought off 30 attackers or something. He's talking about, you know, <laughs> it's kind of an undignified escape, right? He's, it's not heroic in any way. He has to be lowered in a basket and run away. Um, so some people say, well, you know, maybe he's <laughs> showing his um, humility or showing you know, how much he's suffered for, for Christ, another example of that. Any it's questions? Complicated, right? Complicated. Yeah. So the next, so next time we'll finish Second Corinthians, I think, with chapters twelve and thirteen. Sure. He talks about his experience in the third heaven. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. But everybody has a past before he goes to wherever he's supposed to go, right? Yeah. We are all the same. <laughs> the life goes the same. <laughs> We're very interesting. Very. Interesting. Thank you. Good we ever the church the revelation we don't I know. We can, we're, we're going to read it one of these days. Okay. So Revelation, there was a debate. I we talked about Hebrews at the beginning. So there was a debate about Hebrews and Revelation. These were the two most heavily debated books in the of what became the New Testament. And basically, in the eastern part of the church, so more of the Greek fathers, uh, they uh, liked, no, they just, no, wait a second, let me get this right. Yeah, the, the Greek fathers loved Hebrews <clears throat> and wanted to include Hebrews. Even if it was was or wasn't written by Paul, they loved it. They wanted Hebrews in. Revelation, they were a little more concerned because they were concerned about how it could be misinterpreted, which, in fact, has proven quite true that it can be misinterpreted and cause all kinds of problems. Um, so it is a little scary. Yes, so they, they weren't so sure. And it's not that they didn't want to include it as scripture. The original criterion was what can be read in the church. What can be, even in these old manuscripts I'm talking about, like the one of Paul's letters from 150, there's a, you can see if you look at the actual manuscript that someone, a scribe, a second scribe, has gone in and made marks where there are these kind of natural sense divisions, you know, and Probably the theory is, is that he's actually marking out the pericopes, the, the readings for the church services, right? <laughs> so it were, they were making notes to the readers, start here, end here. Um, so it's all about, all of the scriptures came about from what could be read during the liturgy, what could be read during the service. <laughs> and they didn't want to read Revelation during the service uh, publicly because it inspired too much controversy and differing opinions. So the Eastern Fathers were reluctant. So I didn't think it was scripture, but the, it was just problematic. And then the, in the West, it was the opposite. They were very suspicious of Hebrews. They didn't really want to include it because they didn't think Paul wrote it, uh, but they liked Revelation. <laughs> so, so eventually there was a, a compromise. Where both I don't got know what you could explain us all about the Revelation. Yeah, we can do that. That's why it doesn't have to go. I never understood yeah. Advert Catholic. It was never. Yeah. It's but probably because of the the confusion that can arise from exactly. it. So that's why we should read it though yeah. together. Oh. So that we <laughs> and actually there's Revelation is, is fascinating because if you read it with the church's kind of understanding and commentary, you can see pretty clearly it's describing the liturgy. Like the, the Re revelation is, is, has all these images of the liturgy woven into it. And it becomes clear once yeah. we read it carefully. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I understand in Greece, there are a lot of people in it, but I'm going to <laughs> You're going to explain it. <laughs> I feel like a child. Bye, everyone. We love you. Come back next year.